bit of topic for, for this audience because there will be not a single mention of climate or convection permitting in this presentation. However, I think, I, I hope at least, it's going to be relevant for you. So um, um, in the last couple of days, we heard quite a bit about testing of physics for different applications, different scales and so on, and maybe also a bit of tuning and making it work better and nicely. And um, if we just stay with inside the United States at the moment, don't even think about going outside, we see that um, years of independent development have led to a zoo of atmospheric models that are largely incompatible between each other. And that's not only, not only across organizations, but also within organizations. And so here you have just a few of those models listed, and then there's a few more. And um, so that idea of model unification that was brought up in the first talk by Mike this morning um, is sort of becoming a holy grail and becoming a, a central effort for every bigger organization um, in this country, but also outside. So um, we have the unified model in the UK. Um, we have the UFS, NOAA, that's the unified forecasting system. We have the single track um, project at NCAR. And um, the issue with model unification is that um, this term is often misunderstood. So a lot of people think of it like this, like in good old Western days where you would have this final shootout and then you would have to go with the last person standing. And for the younger ones in the audience, this guy is John Wayne. He used to be the, one, the last one usually. But that's not the point. The idea of model unification is more like um, trying to tame the zoo of models and make them work, interact, and, and interchangeable. So make them interact more nicely, make them interchangeable, so that you can come up with a unified system, a unified modeling system <coughs> that allows to replace and, and work with the different pieces. And hopefully we'll be more successful with that effort than this poor guy here. So coming back to the physics development, suppose you're writing some new physics scheme or you're modifying, improving an existing scheme, and you want to have this innovation be available in other models. So let's just look at the American, at the US models. And um, what you would have to do, you would have to tinker with what we call the physics drivers in those models. And to give you an idea, if we just um, count the number of lines of code in the physics drivers in these models after removing comments and empty lines, we end up with a couple of thousand, depending on how many different physics parameterizations you have in there. And all of you in the audience who are not called Jimmy Dudia may guess how much we have for the Wharf model here. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. The unsung hero is 22,000 lines. <laughs> and that's, of course, because of the zillion of parameterizations that you can combine in whatever way. So you hopefully agree that if you make a, 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 an improvement to a model or to a physics scheme and you want this to be transferable, that's not the ideal way to go. So in this context, um, the global model testbed GMTB was created as an area in the Developmental Testbed Center, DTC, um, with the goal to accelerate the transition of physics developments by the community onto NOAA's unified forecasting system. And um, this is sort of a threefold approach. And the first part here is the development of an infrastructure that helps facilitating development and transition of parameterization and physics suites. Then there is also the development of a hierarchical physics testbed harness and the assessment of physics innovations. So this talk is purely about the first point, about the development of, a, of an infrastructure that allows exchanging physics. So this is this called Common Community Physics Package, CCPP, and it actually consists of two different components. One is the framework, CCPP framework, and one is a collection of compliance physics suites called CCPP physics. And the driving principles behind this um, effort are that this system has to be readily, readily available and well supported. So it's open source, it's on GitHub, and it's, it's accepting external contributions uh, through a sort of standardized review and approval process. It's also supposed to be model agnostic to enable collaboration and accelerate those innovations. So we don't want to tie ourselves to just every three in this case. <coughs> um, the key behind this is that we have documented interfaces, which we also refer to as metadata, that facilitate <coughs> using and enhancing existing schemes, adding new schemes, or transferring them between models. So the metadata, this kind of documentation, is, is actually the, the key behind all this. Um, and what I want to mention is that although that, that idea of a physics suite construct, so well, a, a sort of a better combination of physics parameterizations that play together and that are supported and tested, Although this is important, the CCPP must also be able to um, exchange schemes easily within a suite. So you want to replace deep convection 
one deep convection scheme with another one, this should be possible. And what I'm mentioning here in, in, in the parentheses is um, the need for interstitial code. So a lot of this 22 whatever thousand lines of driver code in, in, the, in WARF are what we call interstitial or glue code, which ties together schemes. Yeah, you know, you prepare one array that comes from from um, deep convection, and so that it works with the next shallow convection scheme and stuff like that. So, how does this look like? The CCPP sits in a modeling system just like any other part that, like for example, the die core or the or the I/O subsystem or the MPI communication. And if you want to draw this in an abstract way, you would have all these different components of an atmospheric system um, having some sort of cap that allows this, this interaction between the driver, the atmospheric driver, and that system. Um, and so for CCPP, the CCPP framework, which is sort of the physics driver in this, in this development, sits underneath the atmospheric driver um, with an, using one cap. And then there are caps that speak to each of those physics parameterizations, one for each physics parameterization. And the point here is to make this whole development as easy as possible. So all these physics schemes caps, these guys here, are auto-generated code. No one has to ever write a single line of code to, to, make, to create these caps. Um, that host model cap is a one-off effort, has, has to be created once the system is connected to the CCPP. And it's kind of handcrafted, or you might also say witchcrafted in some sense. But the point is that a lot of the the things that change when you add new physics in, this is also auto-generated code that is just included in that cap through preprocessor statements. So there is no effort once this has been connected once. So the key features of the CCPP is that it's runtime configurable using an XML suite definition file that specifies which kind of parameterizations to run at runtime. Um, the ordering is up to the user, so a user can decide to shift around and move parameterizations as they wish. We have a subcycling capability that allows to run certain schemes at higher frequencies, so shorter time steps than others, or than the dynamics, for example. And we can group schemes into different sections so that we can do other stuff in between. Let's say we want to do radiation, then we do some other stuff in the model, like exchange or like dynamics, and then we do the rest of the physics. So here's an example of um, just a short extract of one of those suite definition files. So this suite is called the GFS 2017 suite. And it does some stuff first, and then there is a group radiation that contains a whole bunch of schemes, and then there is something else in the back. And to make this easier, I categorize those schemes um, with different colors. So the actual schemes, what you would call a physics scheme in your thinking way, is are these two guys with the red bullets, so that's the RRTNG short wave and long wave scheme. And then there are those green schemes, which are a scheme specific interstitial, which are scheme specific interstitial. So this is code that a certain scheme needs to prepare to do beforehand and afterwards. And then there are these two blue bullets, which are suite specific interstitials. So suppose you want to bring the radiation scheme from the GFS suite into a different model, for example, or into a different suite like the RAP and HER suite. Then ideally, if you did everything right, you have to replace those two blue schemes with something like RAP, RRTMG, pre and post. And you would be good. So how does this look like? How much effort is it to write such a CCPP-compliant physics scheme? The answer is actually it's not too bad at all. So all we are requiring is a reasonably modern Fortran code that um, wraps the entire scheme in a module with a certain name. The name here is scheme template. And that contains three predefined entry points. There is an underscore init routine, an underscore finalized, and an underscore run routine. And I think the meaning is pretty obvious from those names. If you don't need to use any of those, for example, in this case here, we don't need to do anything during the init and the finalized phase. You can leave them empty, and they're just sitting there. Any routine that gets used must be, must be preceded by a metadata table, an argument table, that describes the arguments that are going into the scheme in a standardized way. And the experts among you will recognize that these are doc searching comments. So that also serves the purpose of creating automatic documentation for all these, inter for all these uh, physics schemes. So everything that goes into the scheme is described here in terms of a local name, a standard name. That's the key for the entire um, endeavor here. And then some additional attributes like long name, units, rank, type, kind, intent, and whether it's an optional argument or not. And some of them, these things will become clearer to you in, on the next couple of slides. And otherwise, it's just a simple Fortran subroutine as any existing 
physics scheme. So if you have a physics scheme that you want to make CCPP compliant, you put your code underneath here, or you make this a wrapper for your code, and you just mess with this table, and then you're done, basically. So just a warning. Um, the ANCA folks have the hand on this right now because they start working with us at, um, at NOAA. So the, uh, this metadata table layout might change a bit in the future, but the idea stays the same. There is a standardized metadata um, table that describes what goes into this into the scheme and what comes out. So obvious this, obviously, this is a bit of an overhead, but um, I guess the ben I think the benefit you get from this is is um, easily outbalancing this. So first of all, you get documentation for free, as I said, because it's all Doxygen comments. And second, it's really easy to add a parameterization to a model that is already connected to the CCPP. So um, basically, you have to do three things. The first thing is you have to locate the CCPP pre-built configuration, which is a Python script. And you have to add the source, the name of the source file into that, into that list of scheme files that CCPP should be, um, should be compiling. And then there is an advanced feature here that allows you to define different sets of physics, but that's not of interest for this talk. Then the second step is you need to compile, but you only need to compile the CCPP physics library. You don't have to recompile the model for that. And then the third thing is, the third step is that you have to add the new scheme that you want to run at the appropriate location in your suite definition file. So you say you want to do some diagnostics, you want to run it after the microphysics, then you put that entry there. So. How does all this work? So the magic basically lies behind not only having metadata tables on the, on the physics scheme side, but also having metadata tables on the host model side. So these metadata tables here for each of those schemes describe the variables that are required by the physics schemes in order to do their job. The metadata tables on the atmosphere on the host model side, so here for the atmospheric driver, in the same format describe the variables that the host model is providing. And at build time, or pre-build time, there is this Python script, CCPP pre-build, that is running it, that is making the connection between those variables described here and those here by the standard name, so that standard name column in the metadata table. And just as a side note, we are trying to follow the CF conventions as much, much as possible when we, when we draft those standard names, but of course, we need much more than what is available in those standards at the moment. So basically what this pre-built script does, it, it creates a CCPP data structure, which is basically a lookup table that lives in C space, not in Fortran space, and that sits somewhere here near the physics driver. And it's a lookup table that relates the standard name as the key in the table with the location of the variable in memory. It's just a pointer to, mem to a, a certain place in the memory. And then with some fancy magic and logic going on, in that physics driver, whenever you call a physics scheme, this vari these variables will be pulled out from the memory and given to the physics scheme in order to do, do their stuff. So the CCPP is not that old. It, this development started about a year or one and a half ago. But I think we came a long way, and I think we also have a long future. So the first release of the CCPP with um, the GMTB single column model, different development effort of the global model test bed, um, that happened in April 2018, and it contained the GFS operational physics suite as of 2017. We had a second release just about a week or two ago, um, where we had the same physics suites with some improvement bug fixes, and then also the GFDL microphysics, which is one of the physics candidates for the FE3 model. And um, there is also an internal release for FE3 developers at the moment, but that's, as I said, internal, but there will be a public release with FP3 in end of 2018, end of beginning 2019, with the 2020, 2021 physics candidates. So if you want to test those kind of things, or if you want to bring your physics in there and test them there, that's a good, good point to wait for this release and start. So you can find more information at this website, dbt, dtcenter.org, and then so on. And there's also an email address where we provide help and can give you further guidance. I have plenty of time left, that's good. So as I mentioned in the previous slides, NCAR has, currently has the hands on, the, on this metadata table. And the idea, or the reason behind this is that, um, fortunately, NOAA and NCAR agreed to collaborate on developing that physics framework um, and not developing two different things, one for the UFS and one for single tracks. So, Fortunately, we have agreed that we can work together. We have sort of nailed down, or hammered out a few of well, quite a few requirements that are 
coming from NOAA and also from, from NCAR. Unfortunately, we, we decided that we are, good, we are close enough that we can work together on this. So um, that's great news because that means that any kind of physics that is CCPP compliant will be available to all of the NOAA models and all of the NCAR models. So we have, we have the FIM, we have the FP3, we have MPES, we have WARF, and we'll have CSM as well, which is great. So um, as part of this, there will be an update to the metadata standard, as I said, and this includes things like um, encoding information about the vertical direction. Is my scheme doing physics um, TOA to surface, or is it doing surface to the top of the atmosphere? Are my arrays I, K, J? Are they I, K? Are they K, I? All these kind of things will be encoded. Um, is my rainfall in millimeters or is it in meters? Is my rainfall a flux in kilogram per meter square per second or something like that? And the nice thing is about ha the nice thing about having this sort of standard, um, it allows us to automate a lot of um, a lot of things that otherwise would be just really costly, hand-on typing and hand-on coding. For example, if we want to if we want to um, use an I comma K comma J scheme inside a physics uh, I comma K comma J array from a host model inside a physics scheme that uses K comma I or something like that, then we can automate this this task and put that code inside the auto generated cap where we just rearrange the array and put it in a 2D instead of a 3D array. We can flip the vertical ordering if we want to, just with a bit of code, and it's all auto generated. No one has to do this by hand. If you want to convert millimeters to meters, easy. We just scale it before we go in, and then we scale it when we go out again. Um, then there is also derived variables. Wherever there is a standard way to convert something, if you have specific humidity and temperature, you want to calculate relative humidity, stuff like that. All this can be automated, so no one has to has to really worry about, oh, does my scheme do um, specific humidity, or does it use relative humidity and stuff like that. So in my vision, um, but that's not yet decided how this works out in the end, we'll have all these models talk to the framework, so this part is decided. And then underneath, we have different pools of physics. One is a NOAA-supported, a NOAA-vetted pool of physics. There is an NCAR-supported pool of physics. And then there ho is hopefully a common pool of physics where we use exactly the same scheme, the same version of a scheme, and not have, not end up having, I don't know how many different pools of physics here with 17 different versions of the RITMG scheme again, like it is the case right now. So that's all I have. Um, thanks for your attention, and um, hope you enjoy the coffee now. Thank you.